This video is made possible by World of Warships. Right now, you can use the code READY4BATTLE2020 to win a sea bag full of freebies. Check out the link in the description. Vigorous measures at present would soon put an end to this rebellion. The deluded people are made to believe that they are invincible. When this army is ordered to act against them, they will soon be convinced that they are very insignificant and opposed to regular troops. While rangers, sharpshooters, and other irregulars are deployed by both sides during the American Revolution, the Patriots still hold a certain edge over the Redcoats. The vast distances and the time required to transport British troops across the Atlantic constantly keep the numbers of redcoats inferior to those of the American fighters. The British soon find that they cannot hold a conquered territory while simultaneously winning the next battle. Laws in Britain at the time add to the number of British troops, but not to the competency or loyalty of its soldiers. Some criminals are pardoned and sent overseas to fight. Officers and other high-ranking positions are able to be bought. And while the soldier may be wealthy, this is no guarantee of advantage on the battlefield. World of Warships is a hyper-realistic PC and free-to-play game where you can command your choice of more than 300 of history's most iconic warships like the USS Enterprise or the USS Missouri as they appeared during World War II. These vessels are insanely detailed and realistic with the option for upgrades and customization. Join the over 30 million World of Warships players worldwide in this exciting balance of strategy and real-time virtual combat. Download the game using the link in the description and use the promo code READY4BATTLE2020 to receive 700 free doubloons, 1 million credits, a 7-day premium account, the USS Charleston with Stars and Stripes camouflage, and the premium Japanese ship Ishizuki with Lunar Warrior camouflage. Hours of strategy tactical gameplay, and pulse-pounding combat await all who take the helm in World of Warships, the thinking person's action game. Many of those who fight for the Americans are born and raised in the country, know the terrain well, and are willing to sacrifice everything for American independence. Little is known about the life of Timothy Murphy before the American Revolutionary War, but his exploits and skill as a rifleman and sharpshooter during the conflict are paramount. Regardless of the man's seeming anonymity before and after the Revolution, as President Franklin Delano Roosevelt notes while dedicating a monument to Murphy at Saratoga in 1929, this country has been made by Timothy Murphy's, the men in the ranks. Conditions here called for the qualities of the heart and head that Tim Murphy had in abundance. Our history should tell us more of the men in the ranks, for it was to them, more than to the generals, that we were indebted for our military victories. Shortly after the onset of the Revolutionary War, Timothy and his brother John both enlist in Captain John Loden's company of the Northumberland County Riflemen. Two years later, after a promotion to Sergeant of the 12th Pennsylvania Regiment and serving in the Siege of Boston and Battle of Long Island, Timothy Murphy is one of 500 marksmen selected to serve with Morgan's Riflemen a newly formed regiment for sharpshooters. By 1777, Murphy is reportedly able to hit a target seven inches square from 250 yards. His marksmanship is legendary, and Murphy reportedly earns the nickname Sure Shot Tim. This moniker most likely has its origins in the Second Battle of Saratoga, also known as the Battle of Bemis Heights. 
While some historians dispute the story, it is still widely thought that Timothy Murphy fells two British senior officers during the battle. Morgan's riflemen are ordered by General Benedict Arnold, at this time still serving with the Continental Army, to dispose of Brigadier General Simon Fraser, currently rallying British forces that had been pushed back. Morgan calls to the best of his riflemen to carry out Arnold's order. Timothy Murphy takes a position in a tree 300 yards from the battlefield, and upon the sight of Fraser, fires four shots. The third shot strikes Fraser in the midsection, knocking him from his horse. The Brigadier General is taken from the battlefield and dies that evening. Murphy is also credited with the shot that killed Sir Francis Clerk, aide-de-camp to General John Burgoyne, British commander of the forces in Lake Champlain and Hudson River Valley. As Clerk rode onto the battlefield with a message, Murphy again fires four shots, the last striking Clerk. According to legend, Clerk is dead before he hits the ground. While these events are still debated, Murphy is almost single-handedly responsible for keeping raiding British forces at bay during the defense of Middle Fort in New York's Schoharie Valley. By 1780, Timothy Murphy's term of service with Morgan's riflemen has expired. Settling in the Schoharie Valley, Murphy soon enlists in Captain Jacob Hager's company of the 15th Regiment of the Albany County Militia which makes a valiant effort to protect the New York frontier from the British. The Schoharie Valley was a chief supplier of wheat to the American army, and in September of 1780, Colonel Sir John Johnson prepares to lead around 1,000 British soldiers and supporters in a campaign to decimate the wheat supply. By this time in the war, the settlers of the area have seen raid after raid of British troops attacking their homes and farms. Along the Schoharie River, the residents of Schoharie have built three forts, upper, middle, and lower, in defense against the British. On the 17th of October, 1780, a farmer spots Johnson's column marching past Upper Fort. The alarm gun in Upper Fort was fired and the settlers soon took defensive positions. Their cover blown, Johnson's raiders began to burn buildings and destroy much of the livestock and crops they encountered. A party of militiamen, including Murphy, are sent into the fray from Middle Fort to assess the situation and engage the enemy. The militia are soon beaten back into the fort as the British unload rifles, cannon, and mortar fire towards Middle Fort. While the ordinance was superior to the colonists, Middle Fort proved a strong defense against the British barrage. Johnson sees that continued shelling of the fort would only waste time and ammunition. So in a change of tactic, Colonel Johnson sends a truce party towards the fort to broker surrender. Murphy and the other riflemen have heard about the horrors that often befell those captured by the British. They refuse to surrender. Murphy fires a shot above the heads of the truce party. The Redcoats hastily retreat. The commander of Middle Fort, Major Woolsey, is incensed at Murphy and wants to welcome the surrender party as they attempt to make a return. As Woolsey issues an order for the fort to raise the white flag, Murphy threatens to fire upon anyone who attempts to do so, saying, I'll die before they have me prisoner. With Middlefort's seemingly inexhaustible resistance, Johnson soon abandons the siege and moves down the river to Lower Fort, where the British again meet strong opposition. The raiding, burning, and destruction continues to ruin the Schoharie Valley but the forts remain untaken, and American casualties are fewer than three. The bravery, skill, and dedication of individuals like Timothy Murphy ensure that while the grain and livestock crops take an almost crippling blow, the area remains in American control. Thanks to hidden caches of grain and livestock, 
the settlers of the Schoharie Valley soon rebuild and replant. Murphy's reputation as a hero to the valley is cemented, and the monument at Saratoga still stands as a testament to the power of humans over hardware. His Excellency depends upon the colonels for good men, such as they can recommend for their sobriety, honesty, and good behavior. He wishes them to be from 5 feet 8 inches high to 5 feet 10 inches, handsomely and well made. And as there is nothing in his eyes more desirable than cleanliness in a soldier, he desires that particular attention may be made in the choice of such men as are neat and spruce. The general neither wants men with uniforms or arms, nor does he desire any man to be sent to him that is not perfectly willing and desirous of being of this guard. Nearly a year after the Second Continental Congress names George Washington as General and Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army, Washington's Lifeguard, also known as the Commander-in-Chief's Guard, is developed. Charged with the protection of Washington, as well as the official papers and money of the Continental Army, the Guard is first recruited from each regiment present at the Siege of Boston. Four men from each regiment are chosen and the lifeguard grew from 180 men to 250 men as the Continental Army stationed itself near British forces in Morristown, New Jersey. Later recruitment efforts make sure that each of the 13 states are represented among the personnel of the Commander-in-Chief's Guard to ensure the honorable and coveted positions present a united front among the colonies fighting for independence. The uniform worn by the lifeguard is a blue coat with white facings, white waistcoat and breeches, black half gaiters, and a cocked hat with a blue and white feather. Historian Benson Lossing describes the flag of the guard in his 1850 pictorial field book of the revolution. The flag is white silk on which the device is neatly painted. One of the guard is seen holding a horse and is in the act of receiving a flag from the genius of liberty, who is personified as a woman leaning upon the Union shield, near which is the American eagle. The motto of the Corps, Conquer or Die, is upon a ribbon. The Commander-in-Chief's Guard is ostensibly the precursor to the United States Secret Service, which today provides protection to the President of the United States their families, former presidents, and presidential candidates. Their responsibilities also include protection of United States currency, including investigations of counterfeiting and major fraud. Though the lifeguard provides invaluable service throughout the rest of the American Revolutionary War, by 1782, Britain has voted to cease all military operation in America and the unit is disbanded on November 15, 1783. Six months later, the Constitution of the United States is ratified and a new nation is born. It is the 19th of August in 1781. General Washington and Lieutenant General Jean-Baptiste Rochambeau of the French Army begin a celebrated march from Newport, Rhode Island. 4,000 French and 3,000 American soldiers are mobilized toward southeastern Virginia, where General Cornwallis of the British Army has begun fortifying Yorktown with earthworks and redoubts. Early in October, Washington is ready to begin engaging with the enemy, and a corps of sappers and miners secretly commence the construction of trenches in order to execute a siege upon the British. In 1775, the Continental Congress commissions a chief engineer of the Continental Army. By 1777, the commander of the Corps of Engineers is Louis Le Begue du Portail. Born in Orléans, France in 1743 and educated in Mézier, du Portail, a qualified engineer officer, is secretly sent to America in 1777 as part of an agreement brokered by Benjamin Franklin with the government of King Louis XVI. As the Americans prepare to engage the British at Yorktown, 
the trenches and fortifications being secretly constructed are done so under Commander Duportai. After General Washington strikes a few initial ceremonial blows with a pickaxe, the engineers, or sappers and miners as they're nicknamed, begin the work of building a 2,000-yard trench. Three days later, on October 9th, the trench is finished and American and French artillery are in place. They begin a relentless barrage against the British and two days later, on October 11th, are already moving the parallel to a position 400 yards closer to the British lines. The trench cannot be extended as far as the York River as the first had been because of the position of the British redoubts numbers 9 and 10. But no matter. Cornwallis was unaware of the American and French movements and by the morning of the 12th, the Allies have positioned themselves upon the new, closer line. The Corps of Engineers work tirelessly as the Americans and French move closer still. And on October 14th, plans are made for an assault on British redoubts 9 and 10. Sergeant Joseph Plun Martin of the Continental Corps of Sappers and Miners describes his company's orders. The sappers and miners were furnished with axes and were to proceed in front and cut a passage for the troops through the abatis, which are composed of the tops of trees, the small branches cut off with a slanting stroke, which renders them as sharp as spikes. Alexander Hamilton, leading the charge under redoubt number 10, gave orders for the sappers and miners to stay behind and let the infantry do all the fighting. Martin's account continues. As soon as the firing began, our people began to cry, the fort's our own, and it was, rush on, boys. The sappers and miners soon cleared a passage for the infantry, who entered it rapidly. Our miners were ordered not to enter the fort, but there was no stopping them. We will go, they said. Then go to the devil, said the commanding officer. By October 16th, it is clear to Cornwallis that the American and French bombardment shall not be deterred. It appears to the British that the American and French allies have a competition going. Which of them will be able to do more damage to the enemy line? An evacuation attempt is made by Cornwallis via the York River. Only one wave of vessels are able to cross the river before a squall hits and entraps the British. Their fate, it seems, is surrender. On the morning of October 17th, the British send out a drummer and an officer, waving the white handkerchief. General Washington, as well as many others, placed this victory at Yorktown among the Corps of Sappers and Miners' finest hours. Later, speaking very highly of Commander Duportai, Washington says, his plan and conduct of the late attacks in the successful siege of Yorktown afford brilliant proofs of his military genius and set the seal of his reputation. The work of these unconventional soldiers and their tactics prove incredibly useful at both the beginning and the end of the American Revolution to both sides of the conflict. As America continues to develop as its own sovereign nation, these irregular soldiers shall be called upon time and again on the field of battle. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.